Hello, I'm Paul Beckwith. As uh, most people who follow my channel and are aware and have done a bit of study themselves on abrupt climate system change, they know that um, our planet state is extremely dire right now. And um, I've been investigating a group uh, led by Dr. Yi Tao at Harvard. Um, and it's basically called Mere Reflection, M-E-E-R. That stands for Mirrors for Earth's Energy Rebalancing. A number of people have asked me to make some comments on this. So I watched a whole bunch of their videos and I watched, you know, read a lot of the literature that I could find on this. And I'm going to share some of my thoughts with you. So, you know, the language used by uh, Dr. Tao and the group, you know, are that we're in a climate crisis. And as a scientist, he did some due diligence and he looked at the climate system from a non-climatologist point of view. And he came up with some interesting views and I'll discuss those. But he basically came up with the idea, which I've been saying for a long time, that food insecurity is the greatest risk that we face as a species. And we must implement solutions on a global scale now to try to avoid this climate catastrophe. And renewable energy is great, but it's not enough. To, we need to reverse a planetary scale catastrophe. And uh, I like how he opened some of his talks to uh, you know his peers in material science, and you know they they look at microscopy, three D microscopy, things like that. He said to the the at, at the beginning of his scientific talk to his peers, everyone here in this room will witness the end if we do not do anything. Okay, humans need to come together, or we will all perish. Okay, so this, these are the sort of things that he was saying. So their ideas are fundamentally to put mirrors around the earth at various locations to reflect solar energy to get that so that that energy goes back into space rather than being absorbed at the surface and and heating heating and causing um, huge temperature stress. He, of course, thermal stress is it does the worst harm to ecosystems and to ecology. They also talk about using uh, solar thermal concentrators to generate power, saying that that's the most efficient method. The, um, you know, with high efficiency and also using these solar thermal concentrators to disassociate, to break up calcium carbonate, so you get calcium oxide plus carbon dioxide. The carbon dioxide you would capture Okay, so this is a method of carbon dioxide removal. Um, and the calcium oxide you would put into the oceans. So you'd lime the oceans and that would react with the CO2 in the seawater and reduce the acidity. It would soak up the CO2 in the seawater um, and uh, yeah, ad address that problem. So they have a lot of different ideas, the group, and I'm gonna discuss the pros and cons I mean, one of the biggest questions I have is how durable would mirrors on the surface of the earth be for extended periods of time? You know, and what about how, you know, you put all these mirrors in the desert, for example, and you get a massive dust storm. I mean, how do you go and clean off millions of mirrors that can no longer reflect uh, sunlight because they're all grimy and dirty? Or mirrors in the ocean, if they're covered with salt spray and... Uh, you know, as the seawater dries off, they'd be covered with a white film of salt, which would absorb a lot of the, you know, solar radiation, right, and negate the effect of the mirror. Um, and, uh, you know, I really have to, I mean, it's great. They're, these are great ideas. I encourage them. I encourage all this type of thinking. Uh, but I, have, I would have to ask the question, you know, would it be much better to have mirrors on the surface of the earth or to have very, very thin mylar sheets that are aluminized and put them up in space, okay? And then, 
you know, and the launch capability, as I've mentioned, from SpaceX is increasing. It seems that every week they're doing tests, right? And they're, they, have, they're, they have tremendous launch capability uh, with the Falcon 9 rockets, and now they're working on the, um, the SN, um, you know, uh, rockets to, to go to the moon and Mars, right? And they're making tremendous pro progress. So we've got heavy launch capability and I think we really need to look more at deploying mirrors in space to cut back some of the sunlight that's hitting the Earth to cool the planet and buy us time to implement the carbon dioxide removal technologies. Because we're going over a cliff, and if you follow my videos, um, we're losing our carbon sinks um, on the Earth. Okay, so let's get right into uh, you know what the mirror, um, some of the mirror ideas are. So first of all, if you just Google mirrors for Earth, you know, go to go to Google Images and just Google mirrors for Earth's energy rebalancing, which is what M-E-E-R stands for. And you get all you get videos from Dr. Tao and you get lots of, you know, images of uh, here, here's a bunch of mirrors deployed uh, you know, in a schematic deployed in the ocean to reflect sunlight, arrays of mirrors. There's arrays of mirrors to concentrate and focus solar energy um, on towers to, to heat uh, working fluids and generate, um, generate uh, power from this method. Con this is concentrated solar power. Um, okay, so different concepts. Um, to, uh, you know, here's, uh, for example, one ton of CO2, which the average American or Canadian puts out, you know, every two and a half to three weeks, um, could be offset by an eight foot by eight foot mirror in a uh, sunny part of the, of, the, of the earth. Okay, this would, um, in, in terms of off, off the, so the heating from that one ton of CO2 could be offset by by the mirror here. So I'm going to go into some of the details of this technology. It is very interesting technology. And, uh, you know, I think it's th these ideas are very promising. Um, but, you know, are they scalable? Are they feasible? What are the costs? There's, whole, there's a whole group, the mirror group, they have their a website and they, they're, they're very serious about studying all the aspects of, of this technology. Okay, so this is just a Google search of mirror, mirrors for Earth's energy rebalancing, not the Google images search, but just a regular Google search. And you can get the videos. I highly recommend this video um, that came out um, just over a year ago. And also, uh, you know, there's lots of other, other stuff. But okay, so, so this is the... Um, video here, Mirrors for Earth's Energy Rebalancing. Not a lot of viewer, viewers in a year. I highly recommend that you watch this video. As I watched it, I pulled out some interesting images, um, which I'll talk about some of. So first of all, uh, Dr. Tao was looking at um, what happens, you know, what happened without, you know, what happened in terms of, this is global average surface temperature plotted here, relative to 1750, good baseline, proper choice. You know, here's a zero point here. And this is uh, what we've done here. This is the atmospheric CO2 levels associated with those temperatures. So this, the space is temperature CO2, and you can see the curve looking like this. And then you take the last 100 years, and this is what we've done. And clearly, you know, we're way out of line with the natural climate system. This is what we've done in just about in, in just 100 years. 100, anthropogenic human caused climate change is at least 100 times faster than natural variability. These are what they call mobility vectors, okay? So change vectors in the temperature um, CO2 uh, plane. And you can see, um, you know, so the statistical analysis of this type of curve shows that the, this is the direction that we're heading and we'll continue to, to head at in terms of this is the change rate in PPM per, per year. Okay, and you can actually see, 
you know, we're actually reaching some years where they're more like three, up three, three parts per million per year. I mean, these are all clustered around, around two. Okay, and here's another view of it. And here's what we have done in the last 100 years. And you can look at the slopes of these and get the transient climate response. And this is the slope of the Earth system sensitivity. And you can see that, you know, humans have, we've done a real number on, on our climate. I mean, there's no question. And this is the global average surface temperature relative, you know, Celsius relative to 1750. And this is the CO2. So if, we, if you go down in CO2 to, you know, um, this would be about 30 parts per million. You know, plants can't, st there, there's plant starvation. They can't photosynthesize, they can't grow if the CO2 level is too low. If the CO2 level is too high, um, you know, this is, uh, so this is a thousand parts per million, 2000 parts per million. It becomes toxic to animals because the blood becomes too uh, acidic. The carbon dioxide is absorbed in the water and blood in the body and it's too acidic so it's toxic to animals you know we're a long way from that state but this is the temperature here so here's one degree here's two degrees here's three degrees so we reach the thermal tolerance of a lot of life you know at two degrees plus and at three degrees we get catastrophic planetary biological annihilation okay from an, an analysis so this is ha habitability for residents of earth you can do this for each species and get similar things. So, you know, when the CO2 levels get over about 2,000 parts per million, um, that is very, um, it starts to, very bad things start to happen to, to people, okay, uh, that, that, are, that, are connect, that, that are exposed to high CO2 levels. So if you're in a stuffy boardroom, CO2 levels can easily reach this or a stuffy classroom. This is another reason for using CO2 detectors in all indoor spaces and making sure there's adequate ventilation so the CO2 levels don't go above about 800 parts per million. And that is also a way to protect people and really lower the risk of virus transmission in indoor public spaces. And, you know, I've talked about that. If the CO2 is in the water, when you get high levels, you start getting negative effects. So the negative effects are the red, and the levels are going up here. So corals, um, alt mollusks, echinoderms, crustaceans, fishes. There's harmful effects to all of these species as CO2 levels uh, get higher and higher. And they start kicking in. You know, this is 500 to 650 parts per million and so on. You know, you, the, 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 they're already being affected as the levels, you know, reach that sort of, those sort of numbers. Okay. Also, as it gets too hot, there's many, much stress on animals. Okay. Um, so there's, there's temperatures above which they become very, um, you know, they, they, they just don't, don't thrive. And, and they die off as species numbers goes down and there's harm. So there's always this sort of bowed shaped curve you know, where you pass a temperature, you pass a region of temperature and the aerobic, uh, this is metabolism. Um, so there's basal metabolism, metabolism when you're, when the, you know, uh, creature's moving around, etc. And then this is the difference is the green curve. Okay, the same sort of thing with plants. Basically, you reach higher and higher temperatures, you, you pass a temperature peak and the efficiency um, at which animals survive and operate uh, goes way down and they become more sluggish and then, you know, species die off, okay? That's true with viruses and bacteria too. And also, it's not just the temperature range in temperature, the absolute temperature rising, which harmfully affects plants and animals, but it's also the temperature variation. And we're getting more and more temperature variation. The curve is widening. You know, these are thermal events on species, very, very harmful, and really decreases the viability of Earth to support life, to support plants and animals. Okay, some experiments have been done where if you heat a local region two to three degrees, then there's less seeds produced, and after a few years, that species dies out. It's extirpated extirpation from, in other words, locally in that region, that species just dies out. And that's done, um, you know, there's ex this is an experiment to show that as the temperature 
rises to 2.6 degrees, the species dies out. Thank you. I'll continue this video.